Welcome to McKinsey on China. I'm Glenn Leibowitz. China is big. It's complex. But can you understand it in just one hour? That's what Jeff Towson and Jonathan Wetzel argue in the One Hour China Book, in which they describe the six megatrends shaping China today in just six short stories. In this podcast, Nick Leung chats with the authors about why they wrote the book and how the megatrends they describe are reshaping business and society in China. Jeff is managing partner of Towson Capital, a private equity firm. Jonathan is a director in McKinsey's Shanghai office. They both teach at Peking University's Guanghua School of Management. Nick is managing partner of McKinsey's Greater China Practice. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. This week we will discuss: Can you understand China in an hour? And to tackle this question, we have two、um, distinguished authors who have done just that. And、uh, one is our old colleague Jonathan Wetzel, who obviously has been on this、uh, on this podcast many, many times. But we also have a special guest, Jeffrey Towson, and they've just come out with a book called "The One Hour China Book." And、um, I've just read it. Let's、uh, let's have a quick chat first of all about why you wrote this and how should we understand this in terms of、um, you know a, a crash course in China. Thank you, Nick. And I'm going to skip the obvious question of how long did it take you to read the book. Well, to be honest, Jonathan,、um, the book is 120 pages, of which the first 10 are, are, are kind of introductory. So, if you are a fast reader, you can certainly finish it in in an hour and a bit. Of course, it is so fascinating, and I particularly like the pictures that you've chosen of some of the stories of the entrepreneurs. So, actually, I must admit that I took a little longer, but mainly because I wasn't trying to read it as quickly as I could, but I was actually getting quite interested in in some of the stories. So. I must admit that took a little longer, but it was it was definitely an hour well spent. And I think the interesting thing that you that you position here is if you're going to, given the amount of time we spend reading different things about China, which are relatively micro, here's one that takes here's a book that takes a, a sweep at the entire macro trend. And I think what you've tried to do is summarize in six trends the phenomenon of modern China. So why don't you give us a sense of what those are and how should we think about this? You know, with all the noise we hear about every day. Uh, events and, and and issues in China. How should we how should we think about these trends? That was our intent was to try to capture for the audience what is going on in China, so that they can kind of cut through a bit the the buzz of the of the headlines. In, in a sense that you know there is always going to be a new story out on China, and sometimes these stories come out in a way which people look at it and it says, "Wow, that's really strange," or "That's just completely unnatural," doesn't fit my context in any way. And when what we see is having been working and living here for decades, is that in fact the China has a logic. It has a fairly clear and consistent logic that's quite long term. That these trends are longer and stronger, and they're going to keep going. And if you understand those trends, then you can put a lot of those seemingly random events into context. And that's what we try to do in the book.、Uh, we try to take those, you know, take those、uh, events and, and and put them in context. And that one last point on that. It's not just the trend that matters. We think it's also the story because these trends create opportunities, and we can see that people who get the trend, people who understand the trend, they in turn can capture the value, and they create a great story. They create a great company. So in each of these、uh, trends, we try to highlight, you know, who's who gets it, and and what are they doing about it? Because we actually think that really matters. Those are the people that are going to be shaping business in China、uh, and in the world. Yeah, it's very. I think the juxtaposition of the macro trend and then a specific, you know, business entrepreneur or company that is kind of capitalized on the trend is actually particularly interesting as well. And I should probably also mention,、um, and I apologize for not doing so earlier, that you are both professors of Peking University and you've been teaching there for a number of years. And so, from your teaching experience, well, how has that informed this book? The teaching experience. This is Jeff. Is that it's a pretty fascinating mix of. Chinese students, MBAs, Master of Finance, as well as international students. So we speak to them, and this book came a lot of out of that experience. But probably more than that, it came out of meetings we both had in Washington D.C., in London, in South America, whatnot. And this idea: if people are curious, business people,、uh, parents that are maybe concerned about their children's education, local politicians are curious. And this book sort of fell out of all of that. Look, if we had one hour of their time, this is what we would say. Okay, that's great. Why don't you give us a quick overview then、um, of each of the each of these trends and how you've dealt with them? So, Jeffrey, you want to kick us off with、uh, with urbanization or, or Jonathan? First of all, I mean,、uh, not to give the whole story away, but yes, there are six trends, and、uh, in in a nutshell, it's urbanization, the consumer, 
manufacturing at scale, finance, brain power, and the internet. I mean, and we think those six add up to a pretty comprehensive picture of what China is all about. Urbanization is the, I would say, underlying fundamental trend of the trends. It's the thing that shapes everything. Because it's not just an economic trend, it's a social, cultural, environmental one. It's, a, it's fundamentally a human trend. We, we seem to be the people that build cities. And by building cities, by bringing people together for, with higher density and higher frequency of interactions, we change them. We literally change their bodies. They become taller. They become heavier. Uh, we change their brains. They think faster. They talk faster. They have different ways of, of communicating. Uh, we change their consumption, of course. We change their jobs. We change everything. And all that happens in a city. China's in the middle of this process. It's a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-human-history kind of event. 300 mil million people have moved, another 350 million to go. We get to the urban billion by sometime in the 20, late 2020s. That's a, you know, an immense historic change. And for us, that, you know, that spells a new China. Oftentimes we say you know, China is a, is a unique place. Well, it certainly is, but urban China will be even more, if you will, unique in the sense it's going to change China. China, having had 4,000 years of village history, is now going into a fundamentally new era, and we just don't know. We just don't know what that means. Nobody knows what a billion Chinese people living in cities actually means. How will they communicate? What will they want? How will they, how will they work? What kind of, uh, will they live in high rises? Will they live in low rises? These are interesting, fascinating questions which are now appropriate to ask. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, nobody would have asked that question because it wasn't, it wasn't happening. Now it is. That's why urbanization starts our book, because it is the big trend. And with that big trend, what we see is that people who get that, people who understand that it is happening at scale, that it is not going to be a piecemeal process, it's going to be a once-in-a-lifetime massive change, and they go for it with a, you know, if you will, a, I don't want to say commodity, but a standardized approach that can actually deliver the goods, help people, you know, get their, get their job, you know, find their housing, build, you know, get their transport. They can create dynasties, and that's what we see, for example, in the Chinese real estate industry today, that those, those master builders, uh, this is their era, and they're, they're, they're creating their companies today, and uh, those companies will in turn become the global leaders simply given the scale of what's going on in China. Right. The statistic I like and, and the mental image I, I enjoy is if, if you have 18 plus million people moving into cities every year in China, you're basically creating a Japan every eight years. And you have to imagine the local government official in Chongqing or wherever looking at this influx of people every year and, and the questions that must create. How many apartments do we need? How many roads do we need? How many parks do we need? What do we do with the sewage? We're going to need more cops. What policies? I mean, it is such a daunting challenge to deal with all this. Uh, no one has ever had a challenge like this before. Terrific. And that leads us really to the second and perhaps the third of your trends, right? The manufacturing and the consumer. And many of the people coming into the cities, of course, have been, you know, also employed in manufacturing, though fewer than in the construction industry. Still a very, very large number of people have been there. And as China, you know, as, as costs, in, in, you know, go up in China and as China moves up the value chain, which is another explicit objective, you know, what will happen to the large uh, manufacturing bases that have been established and how quickly can, do, you, do you think the economy can, you know, take the, the second of your trends, manufacturing style, scale, and then move to a more consumer-driven society, which is your third of your trends? I'm not 100% convinced the balancing matters that much. If you look at manufacturing in its own right, uh, the world is very well accustomed to made in China. I mean, this is something that people in the United States have known for 15 to 20 years. It's probably the, the China trend that people are most familiar with because you see it when you go down to Walmart. And if you look at the volumes that come out of manufacturing, 80% uh, of the world's air conditioners come from China, 90% of the world's personal computers come from China, although that has a lot to do with assembly as opposed to manufacturing. 75% uh, of the world's solar panels, 70% of the world's cell phones, again, assembly is part of that. 60% uh, of the world's shoes, most everybody's underwear. I mean, these sort of facts, uh, that's going to go forward no matter what happens in other segments of the economy. Um, if anything, I think consumer, you know, the big consumers for these products coming up are going to be Chinese, so it's going to be additive, uh, if anything, I suspect. Uh, you know, that trend, there's, there's a great Warren Buffett quote about he likes companies that have scale, uh, that once you get to a certain size, 
you have competitive advantages that tend to persist. He calls it survival of the fattest. Uh, a lot of Chinese manufacturers have scale. Uh, assuming they have pretty good management, they're going to be able to maintain that. They may shift some facilities to other countries, but there's no reason to think they can be beat easily. Um, I think a lot of these companies are at scale now. And they're not just at scale in things like shoes and bicycles, which would have been the case 10 years ago. They're at scale in things like cell phones, uh, air conditioners, electrical units. I mean, they're moving up the technology curve pretty quickly. And, the other, and I think the other Warren Buffett quote, which is in your book, is that he doesn't invest in companies that compete with Chinese manufacturers. So, yes. So fat and Chinese, I guess, is the, is the secret to success in the future. And um, what about consumers then? So your, your answer is essentially it's not either, it's both. And uh, so let's move on to the, to the third trend, which was consumers. Right. I mean, the either or both. Economists focus on GDP growth and where it's coming from. I, for me, it's all good. If consumers going up and manufacturing is big, you know, I'm pretty happy. Uh, on consumer side, this is a trend people talk about because the numbers are you know, pretty impressive. 300 million people have moved into the middle class, um, and that's in about the last 20, 30 years. But there's another 200 million on the way. So anyone who's riding this wave uh, in a nice form, if you're selling Coca-Colas, if you're selling Starbucks, if you're selling phones, I mean, it's almost like you can't help but make money. So that trend is, is fairly impressive, but unlike, say, urbanization or manufacturing, this is really only a trend of maybe the last five to ten years. If you look at the numbers, it's really started to skyrocket in the last five years. Prior to that, the 1990s, you didn't see it so much. And what I like about this trend is it's unpredictable. Consumers are, you know, are, it's, it's a lot of psychology. People don't know what Chinese consumers are going to want in three years. Certain things are predictable, shoes. But you know, I can remember three to four years ago, people telling me how Starbucks wasn't going to succeed in China. And now the lines are out the door. You know, it's a lot to do with fashion and psychology. And it's pretty unpredictable. And I think it's, it's just because people are trying new things. And they're changing in their taste quite quickly. Terrific. And... Just to move us on then to uh, to the next couple of trends, I think, which are money and brain power. What have you got to say about money, first of all? There's a lot of money here. <laughs> so China is big and there's lots of money in it. I'd like to say something a little more you know, complex or sophisticated than that, but the central point is there's so many articles that come out about the China crash. I mean seems like China's going to crash every, every two or three months, whether it's the shadow banks or it's the local government financing vehicles or it's the investment trusts or it's the real estate or whatever. It is really hard to crater an economy that has $15 trillion in deposits in a closed capital account. There's just so much money around here that it, the issue is, less, is much less about running out of it. It's much more about what to do with it. And I think that's the central point is that you know, this economy has been successful beyond its wildest dreams in creating capital and uh, through a lot of really, really hard work. Uh, when the World Bank and others came to China back in the 80s and said, you guys need to urbanize, we'll lend you the money to do it, China basically said, no, we'll, we'll wait and take our time until we create the capital and then we'll urbanize and we'll spend the money to do it. And that's pretty much what has happened. And they now have this incredible capital reserve. And exactly what do you do with that very huge pile of money? Now, history gives us unfortunate examples that when large piles of money sit around with not much to do, bad things tend to happen. And so there is a challenge here of how to deploy it. It's ultimately a generational challenge because we'll need it. And we just need it in about 30 or 40 years when everybody's retired and we're going to have the, one of the world's more older populations. So that's, you know, so how do we preserve and create capital over the next 30 years in the context of a financial structure which is radically changing? I mean, there is no question that the institutions that intermediate capital in China today, if you think that they're going to be the same in 30 years, that would be perhaps the strangest bet I could take, you know, is that it's very unlikely that the folks who are in charge of the capital today will be the same folks who are running the capital around tomorrow or in, in, in a decade, let's say. But the short message is that there's a lot of money. So if there's one thing you shouldn't really worry about, it's a financial run on the bank in China. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, 
we've had the the prediction of you know the the collapse of this economic phenomenon now for you know as you say every five minutes over the last 20 years so whatever happens in terms of short-term corrections i think the, the very refreshing thing about your book is the, the way you step back and look at the broader trends and uh, and try and, and take the noise out of the system i mean on this particular question of uh, of financial reform of course you know the players themselves are acutely aware of the of the moving target and i think what's interesting about china in in general, but particularly in financial services, is how it has not followed the playbook of the of of the rest of the world at all, right? Um, you know, we haven't seen the development of the of the capital markets in the same way. We haven't seen the development of any of the financial intermediaries in the same way. Shall we move on to brains? Sure, brains. I mean, uh, McKinsey wouldn't be in China if it wasn't for the incredible supply of talent that we find here. I mean, in the early days. I mean, it was really hard to make the case that China was an essential market for anybody. I mean, it was, it was pretty small. It was about low-cost manufacture of something. But the one thing you could say is there are a billion people there, and there have got to be some smart ones. Uh, and in fact, there are. I mean, there's an incredible t- talent supply here. And I think that, you know, say what, as we say in the book, say what you will about the Chinese educational system. Nobody says that it, nobody does, says that it isn't rigorous. <laughs> uh, you know, for the folks who make it through at the end of the pyramid, those are, those are some pretty high caliber folks. And from that, you know, comes, is the seeds of greatness. And we, say, and we see, you know, more and more global companies recognizing that. So over, you know, half of the R&D in China is conducted by multinationals, and they're doing it not just for China, but for global uh, global export. They're uh, uh, adapting their products uh, in for China, and they're also using China as a place to develop products for the global marketplace. Yeah, I mean, some good numbers to, to keep in mind. If you go back to 1998, the number of graduates out of Chinese universities was about a million. That number is about 7.5 million today. I mean, the pure scale increase is, is really phenomenal. Now, when you scale up, you're going to have quality problems, and I think you can see that across the board. If you have a company in Texas and you're looking to do a project, you can ramp up 1,000 Chinese industrial engineers in about a week and a half. I mean, I don't know anywhere else in the world you can do something like that. So this sort of brain power effect coming out of here, it's, it's very similar to the manufacturing, I think that when low-cost manufacturing came on the scene in the 90s, it really rippled through a lot of industries around the world that you needed to integrate this into your business. I think the scale of brain power here, which is also at a fairly low cost point, is going to have a similar effect on other industries, pharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices, uh, software, anything that might have an R&D center. And I think that's what Jonathan is talking about. You see these R&D centers being set up here left and right. Shall we just quickly touch on the last of your um, six trends, which is the, the Internet? Yeah, what to say about the Internet. The, the story I usually talk about is, is QQ. And uh, there's a map on, on uh, QQ's website of where the, all their, web, their users are, QQ being the, the messaging service, that, uh, the leading messenger service in, in China. And it, it's a 24-hour map. It peaks out at usually about 180 or 190 million people uh, on QQ at any given moment in time, and over a 24-hour period, it never drops below 45 or 50 million, which means that at 4 in the morning, there are 45 or 50 million people trying to hook up on QQ, which is a, a pretty amazing thought. And it's just that, you know, this is ultimately a new China. It's a, it, you take the map of where those people are, and it correlates quite well to urbanization. It also correlates quite well to income. It correlates quite well to brain power, to gradu- graduates, and in fact, to manufacturing. And so all of this is the map, if you will, of the new China, and it's communicating its real time. It's online, you know, 24-7, and so information flows that much faster, which has tremendous implications, of course, for the, quote, real economy, in the sense that there is no differentiation in China anymore between online and offline. Every offline business has an impact, is impacted by the online reality of the Internet, whether it's through increasing the productivity of their operations by making their sales force that much more efficient, uh, or by creating a new supply chain, uh, or it's by increasing the markets, because uh, the Internet in turn can enable new markets. And as we, for example, just saw in Internet finance, we are now seeing an entirely new market for asset management created through the Internet, uh, giving small and medium-sized enterprises access to capital, which they would not have otherwise. And that is, uh, that, that is a, a wild phenomenon. It is a relatively under-regulated one at this stage, but it, it's clearly disruptive. It's a great trend, and we think it will create tremendous 
tremendous business opportunities. And we already see, again, some of the Chinese most world challenging, world leading companies are, of course, the internet companies. You gotta be pretty gutsy to compete with Chinese internet companies. I mean, they don't have the scale, but these are some of the most dynamic, rapid companies I've ever encountered. I mean, they, they terrify me. So, by and large, that has been an internal phenomenon. It's been a domestic competition. But you're starting to see that sort of go global to some degree. Online gaming would be one. Uh, online instant messaging like WhatsApp or WeChat would be another one. And you're starting to see these companies go, and they're daunting. Yeah, I think they're terrifying lots of other uh, traditional companies in other sectors in China as the internet, as you said, Jonathan, pervades every part of Chinese, uh, the economy and society. Um, the Chinese internet companies are also, you know, eyeing jealously the profit pools outside of their own, uh, their, their current ones. And uh, I think they're terrifying lots of people at the moment with the uh, with the rapidity of their of their growth and the, uh, the the speed with which they can they can adapt to different models is, is is quite impressive. I mean, internet finance is is you know the one people are talking about right now. It goes from hey, we've got an idea, an internet company should offer an online uh, investment product, to having eighty billion dollars under management in nine months. I mean, it's. It's not only disruptive, it's really fast. And I think you know, a lot of the banks in particular have still been knocked back on their heels by this. Terrific. And uh, so I would encourage all the lis all listeners to go off and invest an hour, read your book, and please uh, tell us if you have any questions, and we'll get these uh, two authors back on to answer them. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Go to Amazon.com where you can download the Kindle version or order a softcover edition of The One Hour China Book.